Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. Thank you for joining us from, from your various time zones for this three-day symposium. My name is Christine Mullen Kramer, and I serve as Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, and I'll be moderate, uh, the moderator of today's session. Before we begin the program, however, I'd like to take a few minutes or a moment or two to just review the features of this Zoom webinar. First of all, to submit a question, please click the Q&A icon at the, uh, on your screen. A window will appear where you can type your question. Our panel is very full, but we'll do our very best to get to as many of your questions as we can at the end of uh, the sessions. Rest assured that all questions will be reviewed by our team and that will greatly inform our work moving forward. Members of our team will post additional information into the chat box as needed throughout the program. You can use the gray line uh, in the uh, middle of the screen to make either the presentation or the speaker bigger, depending on your own preference. And uh, to use the closed captioning, click the CC or closed caption icon below. Text will appear on the bottom of the screen. We've got a great program today to kick off our three-day symposium, which is co-organized by the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art and the National Museum of Asian Art, the Freer Gallery of Art, and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. Our core planning team includes my colleagues at African Art, uh, Karen Milborn, and our colleagues at the Freer and Sackler, uh, Emma Stein, Sana Mirza, and Lizzie Stein. Sana has played a particularly active role in keeping our team on point throughout this project. So thank you, Sana, for your good work on this initiative and for all you do. Before we move on to today's session, we would like to recognize the funding support for our project that was provided by the Smithsonian's Office of the Provost and to thank colleagues within and outside our two museums who contributed their ideas to a workshop we had in December. Yes, in person, back in the day, Imagine that. Uh, we'd also like to recognize the support of Deborah Mack, Interim Director of the National Museum of African Art, Chase Robinson, Director, uh, and Masume Fahad, Deputy Director of the Smithsonian Asian Art Museum. As you know, Africa and Asia have emerged as prominent centers of world power, with combined populations making up more than 75% of humankind. Our project examines the globally realigning exchanges of the present day by returning to overlooked or little examined histories and opening new lines of inquiry engaged with art. Connections between African and Asian spaces have defined cultural identities and expressions across centuries. This symposium will consider the dynamic locations, unique objects, and remarkable individuals whose stories evidence a radical realignment of historical power structures and axes of travel, growth, and exchange. Papers will range from antiquity to the present with an emphasis on art and material culture. Our panel today explores connections between African and Asian spaces from antiquity to the present day. We have a very full session ahead of us, so I will urge our presenters to kindly keep to the 20 minute per presentation time limit to allow ample time for questions at the end. Professor Elizabeth Lamborn will offer an introductory uh, overview of Africa Asia and the historic connections between these regions. Professor Pedro Pombo, artist Shiraz Baiju, and curator Zoe Butt will then consider key sites of exchange and their cosmopolitan milieus. And Kathleen, uh, Dr. Kathleen Bickford Burzak will kick off the discussion with a prepared response. And then I'll come back to field the uh, Q&A session. And our presenters will also be uh, up there on the screen to respond as time permits. So uh, we'll turn to our first paper. Our first presenter today is Dr. Elizabeth Lamborn, who is a reader or associate professor in South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies at the Montfort University in the UK. A historian of South Asian and the Indian Ocean world before 1500 CE, uh, she, Elizabeth is committed to the interdisciplinary and cross-cultural study of medieval history. And her work engages equally with texts and with things, and with texts as material things. So Elizabeth, uh, please, uh, 
queue up your slides and begin the presentation. And again, welcome to you all. Hello, everybody. Excuse some apologies for that glitch. Um, I'm with you now. Firstly, um, thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to participate today. I'm going to jump straight in as time is short. Um, I hope you'll understand no overview, especially of 20 minutes, can satisfy all expectations. So please bear with me as I present one way of looking uh, um, and thinking about the long history of exchanges between Asia and Africa. Now, before commercial flights changed world connectivities back in the 1950s, the Indian Ocean had been a primary interface between Africa and Asia um, for millennia. I'm a scholar of the Indian Ocean, and you will hear me refer to this space throughout this overview. Um, often I might use the term Afrasia, which is a slight easier to pronounce version of the Africasia of the title of this symposium. It's a term that's been used for some while by scholars of the Indian Ocean to refer to this, these two big continental masses and their exchanges. Um, whoops. Um, I'm also not a modernist. So I'm a medievalist by training, um, and this overview embraces not only the medieval exchanges, but prehistoric ones too. As you can see from this slide, I'm going to begin around 3000, 2500 BC, and take us through right through to the present day. Um, this is a long history of Afrasian ex exchanges. The majority of papers and speakers that we're going to be listening to over these three days um, are covering material, I'd say, prominently from the last 250, 300 years. So this is an overview that takes this some um, 20 times over, um, 5,000 years of exchange, um, which I think can be a useful, um, broader context um, to develop ideas within. Um, it's also an overview that recognizes sometimes the limitations of thinking about exchange only through material culture and art and perhaps particularly in the museum context where there are sometimes very clear aesthetic ideas and preferences about the kind of object that is used for narration and storytelling. Um, there are going to be several key themes and ideas that I want to raise in my talk, but that will hopefully be relevant um, going through um, the whole three days. One is the, really the question of evidence. Um, it's very diverse for this, these hu two huge continents. It's very unevenly patterned, so we have um, it, good quality written information for both areas only from 1500 onwards, but substantially earlier for Asia. Material and visual culture is similarly very um, unevenly patterned, heavily dependent both on um, material cultures, conditions of survival of material and um, national programs of archaeology and art historical collecting. I'm going to begin by talking to you about a really interesting new category of evidence, which is genomic evidence analysis of ancient DNA that is really um, revealing unbelievable unwritten histories of exchange. And of course, as we move um, into the nation state in the modern period, we increasingly have statistical data, which can also help contextualize and interpret um, the exchanges. I'd also like us to think about interfaces so, um, again, a massive expansion and increasing complexity after 1500, with the East African coast becoming, and South Asia becoming only smaller parts of much complex global interfaces between the two continents, and disciplinary interfaces as well, because the variety of material I'm suggesting we think about today obviously involves scholars from very different um, disciplines, and I think in the museum context, it's really interesting to ask what is unique about the story told by art and how does it or should it connect even to wider narratives? There we go. So I'm beginning then with highlight one, early food globalization. Now, art and material culture represent a particular category of exchange, which is obviously foregrounded and valued here today. 
Um, but I don't think we should always rely on them to tell the whole story. And so I'm going to begin 5,000 years ago, when over the last 10, 15 years, new archaeological techniques, um, new ar excavation techniques as well, are giving us some of the first evidence for large scale movements of food crops and animals, and by implication people, in both directions between Africa and Asia. Both are developing their unique food cultures um, through millennia of exchanges. Um, and we're beginning to realize that many agricultural land landscapes, such as the one that you can see on this slide, a view of rice paddies and coconuts on Pemba Island in East Africa, are the result really of very complex interactions in multiple directions over a very long time. So we now know from, that from as early as 2500 BCE, um, Chinese cereals are entering West Asia and being cultivated. They're found in contexts that should suggest purposeful cultivation as a food crop. And similarly, a huge range of very important millets, sorghums, are moving from Africa into South Asia, um, as you can see in the small inset map on the right. Um, from island Southeast Asia, we find major centers of domestication of bananas, which obviously become a global commodity eventually by the colonial period, um, items such as sandalwood, and of course the chicken which is um, originally a Southeast Asian forest bird um, and now one of the most widely eaten meats in the world. So we have a lot to thank these early periods for. Just bringing us up then to 500 BCE, the Iron Age um, is a period where research is now showing the important trio um, of, of African foodstuffs, banana, taro and yam, have a Southeast Asian origin and enter even parts of Central Africa around 500 BCE. So you can see a real toing and froing. Um, I focused here on the botanical exchanges, but with them travel mice, rats, and all the other kind of animals that um, frequently live off stored crops as well. These exchanges, uh, to emphasize again, they're not accidental, but archeologists of this period avoid the issue of the routes and means of transportation by which these um, important food crops may be circulating and it's perhaps something we can talk about afterwards. Um, the main thing is the DNA analysis of these recovered seeds and remains is providing unique evidence um, for what's happening and this will tie in nicely with coming talks by Shiraz Beiju and um, Pedro Pombo about Afrasian places and um, traditions of agriculture plantation. I'm moving now to highlight two the Afrasian trade boom. Now Africa never ceased to be connected um, with the Mediterranean to the north and the Asian worlds but we see a increase in the volume and frequency of exchanges from the mid 18th, uh, 8th century onwards, excuse me, um, particularly with South and Southeast Asia as intermediaries and the map of trade routes you see on this slide shows you clearly some of the main connections and the important role of South and Southeast Asia as um, waypoints with longer trade routes through to East Asia. Um, East African coast, Madagascar, the Comoros are all involved in direct exchanges with the Middle East, South and Southeast Asia. Um, finds of Chinese ceramics on the African coast witness the participation of Swahili peoples in new Pan-Afrasian fashions and at the same time um, Persian ceramics or ceramics produced in southern Mesopotamia and southern Iraq um, are finding great popularity around the Indian Ocean from Japan right through to um, cent uh, the Central East African coast. On your right you see a turquoise glazed jar from southern Iraq that was very coveted at the period, particularly in the Far East where there was a bit of a fashion for all things Persian. Um, on your left you see a photograph from a very important mid-9th century 
um, wreck found in Indonesian waters, but that was carrying a cargo of Chinese ceramics from Hunan province, all destined for Middle Eastern markets, but shards of similar bowls called Changsha bowls have also been found along the East African um, coast. So in Wednesday, um, in Ruth Barnes' paper, Ships of Plenty, you'll have an opportunity to see more about the goods of this first trade boom and the material culture of the Middle Ages. It's a period at which we can probably say we have the first museum quality survivals in telling this story of African exchanges, but it's some um, almost 4,000 years after the first circulations of crops. Um, stylistic analysis shows that these producers at different ends of these very long networks had very clear understandings of what tastes in different parts of the um, trade networks were and produced accordingly. Um, glass beads, seed beads such as these are another important if very modest um, kind of visual um, material source um, which helps us understand these networks and connections. Um, and it's important to emphasize that Africa was not just an importer. Textual sources give a much truer picture of the range of items circulating. And we have the case that particularly for, for East Africa, a lot of the exported items were very ephemeral archeologically or perishable. And so we don't necessarily have the material traces that we'd like for this very vibrant period. Um, during this period then, as you can see on this updated map of trade systems, um, East Africa really joins the trade circuits of the Western Indian Ocean and via them interconnects both east to China and west to the Mediterranean, if you think of it as a bit of like a relay race. Um, I'm going to move now to talk about ages of exploration. I'm jumping 500 years ahead, excuse me, um, to a key juncture, not only in circuits of the Indian Ocean, but to change in global circuits of circulation and exchange. Um, the term age of exploration is commonly used of the late 15th, 16th centuries, um, a period of European driven exploration, which has changed world history. So to just give a key few, few dates, 1498, Vasco da Gama rounds the Cape of Good Hope and sails into the Indian Ocean world. He establishes what's going to become the only direct maritime route between Europe and the Far East until the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. Um, six years previously, you have Columbus um, opening out in to the Atlantic and 1522 Magellan completes his first circumnavigation of the globe. So these are really complex, um, important voyages that have, have world-changing implications. They spark processes of European settlement, um, genocide of indigenous peoples, um, and eventually European colonial rule that changed world history. Um, 60 years before Vasco da Gama, a Chinese admiral named Cheng Ho completes the last of seven imperial sponsored voyages across the Indian Ocean, which you see in this map here, um, traveling as far as the eastern coast of Africa. These voyages represent a rare instance of large scale, so some numbers of up to 30,000 men on these voyages are mentioned. Um, this is the, a, a rare large scale official Chinese engagement with Africa. Before this, individual Chinese travelers and merchant diasporas had been active in the Indian Ocean exchanges for centuries and they continued to be active afterwards. But this stands out really as a state to state engagement. Um, the voyages did not have on the whole a long term impact because subsequent Ming emperors withdrew their sponsorship, lost interest in this kind of venture. Um, but I think I'd like to make the point here that sometimes brief moments of exchange 
yield objects and ideas that are far more powerful or charismatic than the duration of the encounter itself. So 1405 to 1433, these voyages have left some quite significant memories and ideas. Talking in terms of objects, for example, we have this very beautiful Chinese painting of uh, a giraffe which traveled to China via Bengal in a series of diplomatic gifts. Um, and it's possibly one of the most iconic objects embodying this idea of exchanges between Africa and the very far east um, of Asia. Today, though, I'd like to make the point that these objects and the narratives of the voyages that survive um, serve as important historical precedents for Chinese political engagement and entrepreneurship in the Indian Ocean world. Um, China commemorates Cheng Ho with an annual holiday. And the voyages are also held up as examples of Asian exploratory initiative before the European age of exploration. So a participation in more global processes um, that has become quite important since 2013. And I'll tie that link up to you in a second. I hope you are still um, holding in there. Highlight four, we're nearing the end. Afrasia in colonial flows. Now, when we come to this period, I'm not sure any one object can really satisfactorily embody exchanges after 1500 on the global scale that they take on. Um, instead, I've chosen, chosen a short clip, a one minute visualization of ships voyages in the mid 18th century as recorded in surviving ships, logs and books. Um, note, as you watch this in a minute, the huge importance of the Cape route, but above all, I'd like you to notice these, spi these sparkles, these um, explosions of shipping activity all around the African seaboard that really signals the end of Eastern Africa's privileged position as this interface with the Far East. Um, so I will let my colleague now The logbooks themselves are a really interesting reminder of the increased volume and quality of data that we have available on exchanges after 1500. Um, so you can see um, how lively now both the Cape route round from Europe to East Asian waters is, but also all these sp um, little sparkles and explosions of shipping activity all around the African coast. It's a real change. Um, the, there is, of course, though, uh, a bit of a Eurocentric privilege in this, and I'm very excited by papers that are going to be coming that um, give us insights into um, Malay sources on exchanges between um, Islamic Southeast Asia and Southern Africa, or similarly Africans in Japan through this variety of sources. It's really important to keep that in mind. Nevertheless, um, even the European sources make clear that the period after 1500 is really um, quite one of quite extraordinary change with major shifts in centres of production, scales and patterns of consumption, flows of labour, um, people, free and unfree, technologies, commodities circulate with unprecedented regularity on a scale never seen before. And of course, the wider political background to all this is the gradual but systematic and in some ways unstoppable imposition of colonial rule over many key regional players in these exchanges. This is a map of um, European and US colonies after 1945 at the end of World War II. And you can still see how so much of the East African coast is occupied by various colonial powers. Um, I'm sure many people will be slightly dissatisfied with me 
concertina in 500 years of very complex um, political and economic history into 500 years. But again, as I said, the focus of many papers coming is on this exactly this period, and I'm sure we'll have a very good chance to develop a much more fleshed out and nuanced understanding of the complexity of this period. If you wanted me to single out one object that kind of sums up these um, new global flows, I think I'd pick ships because they are really the key vehicles of circulation and the rise in size, um, extent of circulation really enables this increased communication that goes on. Finishing now very quickly um, with the contemporary period up to the present day, um, as we know, the dominant Asian player in Afro-Asian exchanges today is the People's Republic of China, um, founded in 1949, which is why you see the date there. Um, and it's a really interesting time at the moment to consider um, how this will play out in the future. So I think the symposium is very well timed. As you can see, there's surprisingly small scale, small scale human movements um, on all half a million Africans in China, potentially in 2018. Uh, um, one to two million Chinese possibly, but very large scale financial movements under this. Um, just wrapping up then, I wanted to make the point that historic patterns of exchange are now being used to brand new initiatives. So 2013, the announcement of the um, Belt and Road Initiative with this idea of the new Maritime Silk Road. And you can see, I hope, these um, blue lines indicating the new plan for the Chinese new um, maritime Silk Road, and also a big increase in China in scholastic um, academic activity and archaeological activity, looking at the history of maritime exchanges and China in Africa. Um, looking then at this, globally European countries are the largest investors in Africa still, but if you put China with Hong Kong together, they are actually second to the Netherlands um, for 2018 in terms of investment in Africa. The, I think it's very interesting to talk about what the future holds. We know that financial um, and economic entanglement between countries often comes wrapped in cultural activity as well in the sponsoring of shared exhibitions, in the foundation of museums, or the sponsorship of artistic exchanges. And with world economies scheduled to contract and the COVID pandemic, I think it's a very interesting time for this symposium to consider what the future will hold as well after these millennia of exchanges. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for covering so much ground so well and in so little time. Very much appreciated. Well done. <laughs> okay, well, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pedro Pombo, who is assistant professor at Goa University in India. He received his PhD in anthropology in 2015 from the University Institute of Lisbon in Portugal, with a research focus on spatial belonging, local history, and personal narratives in southern Mozambique. Pedro investigates traces of maritime circulations in the Indian Ocean through dialogues between cartography and archives, art, heritage, and material culture. Pedro, cue up your, your presentation and feel free to begin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, based on research on Afro-Asian worlds, this presentation uh, is the exploration that I've been doing more recently in find new templates for a kind of counter cartographies of the Indian Ocean coasts and archipelagos, and also their built social and natural ecologies. Um, exploring the concept of place uh, in dialogue with the other concepts of this symposium, people and objects, I discuss my field with experiences between Western India and East Africa on how ethnographic research on, uh, from one side, material traces, and the other side, embodied memories of migration, as also the natural environments they exist, can help us to unveil different cartographies and different maps of these Afrasian worlds. Uh, studying maritime connections in port cities and islands 
organically open space to the aesthetics and epistemological possibilities of the coastal landscapes. Observations on architecture, personal memories, social and intimate spaces, by other sides, dialogue with visual and audible discoveries of estuaries and mangroves, backwaters and bays, but also historical urban centers, daily life activities, words spoken or language scripts. Assuming a sensorial approach to places and the multiplicity of histories and elements they embody, tangible, intangible, affective, mnemonic and environmental, I engage here with the Western Indian Ocean as an Afrasian place where the locations are simultaneously rooted on land and on water. And I depart this from three sets of locations that interact at different scales. The coast, the islands, and the house. I will skip to this one. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, in, the, in the case of the Western Indian Ocean archipelagos and environments, the islands and insular um, um, places have had a central role in the political, social, and economic regional histories. And the qualities of islandness, as a concept developed by Pamela Gupta, in the region disturbed assumed dichotomies between central and periphery, mainlands, and maritime. And I think this is one of the interesting ideas of the Indian Ocean as a space of circulation is the, what may appear to be peripheric uh, actually became very central in along the historical times. At smaller scales, urban ensembles, architectural styles, or domestic spaces that are invisible from the streets uh, can reveal in their aesthetics and the memories they keep affinities built across space and time while intimate and family spaces can become sometimes literally, as we will see, uh, as uh, authentic museums of family histories, the public display of cultural belonging through the creative elements or community spaces complexifies ideas of, no of nation states and citizenship. Thinking at different scales and constitute constitutive elements allow us to organically connect places, people and objects as all of them are interweaved in multiple ways. This in turn can open uh, ways for alternative maps drawn not with dividing lines that we see as the political maps that we all know, but using the instability of the ocean shores and their lives and how they are perceived. Um, one of the ways is to try to look these connections instead of connecting uh, dots, as you can see in the image, which are nodal points of uh, maritime uh, connection, we can think of something more like sound waves, which will expand and contract and overlap across time and space in many different languages, many different cultural traditions, many different commodities, but build something that, uh, that dialogues intimately with the monsoon system and with the temporary circulations that cross this Indian Ocean and then from the Indian Ocean to the other Atlantic, to the Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, going to my first place, uh, coast, these are two images. The, the upper image is the island of Diu in the western coast of India and the lower is an aerial view of the city of Dar es Salaam in uh, Tanzania. Coastal landscapes are seen uh, here in this research as archives and conceptual frames of water and soil. Coasts are the place of ports, harbors, bays, river deltas, where the ships uh, are moored and oceanic lives and mainland lives cross and exchange. The transition between ocean in this Western Indian Ocean can be done by clear turquoise waters, as in Zanzibar, Mauritius, or Maldives, but also with muddy deltas and tidal plains, as in the uh, Western India uh, coasts of Kambai Bay and Goa. Uh, these two images are visual explorations of how to perceive precisely the coastal and the uh, intervening of an, an open ocean through coastal and paddy fields and floodplains 
which will in the north is in Goa, in, in, the, in the lower part is the Kambai Bay, and through the, how historically the river uh, delta silted, the port cities had to change place, the landscape is systematically flooded during the monsoon. So how these tidal movements can also make us think of different stories or personal stories that do not really translate a more rigorous or timeline progressions of official histories and sometimes the official nation state histories. Um, and I, I play here or I engage here with the notion of sediments or the notion of muddy and so where the lines are not uh, drawable, for example, on the lower image where we have a set of maps which when you use the lines, do not really explain the reality that is there because precisely it's tidal plains, the reality is never the same along the, the year and along the months. So how do we deal with this? How do we engage with this landscape to make us feel and think in different ways? Islands. Uh, the upper image is the island view. Is a, and it's a, a zoom on the old city of Diu with the fort the, uh, renovated uh, when the Portuguese conquered the islands. And in the center, you have the whole the old town of Diu, with the, which is called Firangiruara, the neighbor of the, of the foreigners, which is the Catholic community space, and then the Muslim and Hindu communities. And in the south is a stone town in Zanzibar. Islands are fascinating locations for conceptual thinking on this region. With the exception of Madagascar, which is uh, a very big island, the, their small scale of these islands is inverse to their role in the maritime trades. From coastal islands as Zanzibar, Diu, Lamu, or Mozambique islands, we can uh, cross to open ocean archipelagos as Seychelles, Comoros, or Maldives. And in this place, the African and Asian continents dissolve into coral reefs, volcanic mountains, or mangroves. Islands and their port towns are seen as cosmopolitan places sustained by the circulation of people, commodities, and objects. And at the same time, they work as a continuation both of the ocean and both of the mainland lives. One aspect that I wish to highlight in this research is a chromatic sense. It's one way of exploring this space through aesthetics and chromatic senses. The picture on uh, the upper picture is a stone town in Zanzibar, and the lower picture is a visual composition of uh, the uh, old town and the Diu Islands, where you can see a kind of continuity of colors between the ocean and the material uh, and built heritage. In these two pictures, uh, these two pictures reflect the presence of a sensual aspect that is uh, characteristic of this region. Tones of turquoise, blues, and greens encountered on the, on, both on the waters, for example, at Zanzibar and coral lagoons, but also in door frames and buildings in Diu. They feel the material dimensions of the places while for example, memorials like this, which is in Saint Denis, in Reunion. It's a memorial to celebrate the inter uh, migrant laborers coming to the islands. And it's written in um, Gujarati script, in the local Creole, and uh, in uh, Urdu script. Gujarati and Urdu being South Asian languages. Or, or we have, for example, chromatic senses, or we have this kind of monuments that tell us about the cosmopolitanism and tell us about the multiplicity of languages and communities that inhabit these islands. Or we have, for example, visual signs of names from different continents and different uh, and many different religions, as we see here, for example. Uh, familiar architecture features with all these kind of creolized architectures that we see across the Indian Ocean uh, make, rec make this region being recognizable by these features. Scripts and languages that cross Asian and African territories, gastronomy, South Asian, Cantonese, East African, Muslim, Christian, Jain or Hindu names populated the streets and populated the commercial signs and the visual culture of the places. 
In this, this uh, the picture in of uh, Hotel Mozambique is in the island of Diu. It's an old hotel owned by a family that had business in Mozambique. And then we see the Robin Batista is a photographer in Zanzibar of Goan origin. Uh, Dr. Meta, Meta is a, a Gujarati name, and the Dr. Meta it's a very uh, famous uh, um, family of doctors that migrated several generations ago to Zanzibar from Gujarat. And this commercial sign of parcel services to London, Lisbon, and Mozambique, it's found in Diu. It, it shows the contemporary diasporic roots, roots after the African independence, uh, uh, both Tanzania and, and uh, Kenya and Uganda, and after in 75, the Mozambican independence, and the second diasporic movements, or to Lisbon, London, or many times from Tanzania to, um, to Canada. Oh, these are two images, sorry. These are two images. The, the image on the left is in Stone Town in Zanzibar. The image on the right is in Diu. And it's just, a, I mean, of course, don't have time to um, talk in depth, but there is a sense of similarity. There is a geometric architectural features in Diu that remind us the geometry of the Omani Zanzibari houses in the exterior. Although in Diu, the windows, the window frames are much more decorated, while in Zanzibar usually it's only the doors. And then we see on the picture on the left, the cathedral of a stone town in Zanzibar, which was mostly alive due to very important Goan community since the turn to the 20th century. The last place, the smaller scale, the house. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is a picture of a, a house of a trading family, a Hindu trading family in Diu, which very long connections with uh, Mozambique and uh, uh, even British East Africa. In an apparent smaller scale, now I focus in the house. It is understood as a building itself, but it is understood also as a home, as an outdoor space that faces the street, but also as an inner space where family and social interaction happens and identities in the diaspora are performed. The home is where aesthetics and culture are brought with the luggage when families migrate. When lives are spent in diaspora, as we see, for example, here um, in Zanzibari doors, which have Gujarati origin carving, while all the town buildings resemble the geometric Omani architectures, as I saw. Um, the, uh, the picture on the left and the central picture are um, called Zanzibari doors, with Gujarati origin carving in Zanzibar, and the uh, right and picture is a picture of the whole house in view. So we see in the domestic space how uh, decorative elements, how elements of craftsmanship, which are also cultural belongings, cross and will establish in a domestic places, which are at the same time uh, public because they are facing the street, but also extremely private, are all how these elements also cross the ocean and begin a new integration in the new place, becoming, becoming, for example, Zanzibari and not only Gujarati, because they are integrated in the place aesthetics and sensibility. Um, this is another very curious example. The picture on the top is a house uh, built by a Goan family at the turn of the, in the beginning of the 20th century. And it's the only house in Zanzibar that has this uh, window, which doesn't have glass, but uses uh, oyster shell, which is a very typical uh, window in uh, Goan architecture. So this is the only case in Zanzibar that we find that even this oyster shell, even these very deeply Goan rooted uh, aesthetics cross the ocean and we will be part of a house by a Goan family which is becoming Zanzibari by her presence in the island, but it also keeps their uh, cultural roots to go on. One relevant aspect, and this is uh, something that one relevant aspect of these islands is the fact that more large scale 
distinguishable examples of architecture, it is the urban ensembles that translates the Indian Ocean world in the sensorial aspects. Familiar architecture features, recognizable decorative carvings as in the picture, um, in the lower picture, one is from Zanzibar, the other one is from Rio. Uh, and it's precisely these elements which are parts of the architecture but are also parts of the cultural and senses of belonging that become extremely important in these diasporic lives that live in both margins of the ocean. As is, for example, what is called decorative arts and from that furniture, the image on the left, it's a house in a Seychelles and the image on the right, it's the Sultan's Palace in Zanzibar. But we notice, especially in the 19th century, we notice there that is a, a circulation of forms and techniques and decorative elements and comforts that will cross around this area and will become, in sometimes it's called the Creole architecture, sometimes it's called Indo-Portuguese or Anglo-Indian architecture, but in, I brought these images here because in art history they have, they are hyphenized terms. And this is interesting because when we call something Indo-Portuguese, we are assuming that it belongs to an amalgamation of culture. It belongs to different places and to cultural contexts that created something different. And in the, across the Indian Ocean, it's very, this sense of belonging to different places, it's very visible and very uh, easily sensed. Some other buildings, for example, are very different kinds, sorry, different kinds of buildings. Yes, one minute, I'm finishing. These are two old Goan clubs. The image on the top is the Goan club in Zanzibar. The image on uh, the lower image is the uh, old Goan club in Dar es Salaam. And I bring these, or the, for example, the image on the right, which is the celebration of the centenary of the Goan Association in Dar es Salaam, performing a Portuguese dance or Portuguese flags in Goa. This tell us how in contemporary times, uh, these identity and cultural performances to a past, which is in the case of Goan diaspora, it's both Portuguese, it's both Indian, it's also Goan and it's also Tanzanian. This is an example of a Goan doctor which was um, condecorated by the Zanzibari Sultan and when he returned to his Goa village, he had the authorization to build a house copying the palace of the Sultan. So his house is completely different from the other typical uh, Goan houses. And this is interesting. How can you see Zanzibar also in Goa? And this is a, I finished with a particular family museum in Old Diu, where we can see many old documents and also in family documents in Goa, where these houses, the domestic spaces, besides objects and besides uh, aesthetics, also have an family museums of documents, travel, travel authorizations, passports, family names that are vital to understand the possibilities of circulation across the ocean and the possibility of live and belong to different places, crossing colonial borders and today crossing nation state borders. And I, I finish now. From the coast to the, to the island, to the house, these are gradation of elements and qualities that allow us to draw multiple maps of the Indian Ocean. The singularity of this world is that in an expression heard in a small street or in the colors of the shallow coral lagoon or in the colors of the buildings, we can sense a belonging to a world that has the ocean as its center with it when its margins reflect the, its chromatic tones, its environmental characteristics and immobilize in stone words or objects the ever-changing sea movements that allow all the circulations across the Indian Ocean. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry if I, um, I'm sorry if I cross the 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm very sorry about it. <laughs> no worries, Pedro. Great paper. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for this terrific presentation. You know, your sort of early image of the sound waves 
uh, really capture, I think, the point of your paper of these dynamic uh, connections between Africa and Asia over time and how, you know, uh, spaces, uh, landscapes, and, and color uh, can all serve as these sort of conceptual and visual frames that document this history over time. So thank you so much uh, for mm -hmm. that. And so now I'm delighted to introduce uh, Shiraz Baiju, an artist based between London and Mauritius. Shiraz studied painting at the University of Wales Institute, Cardiff, and was artist in residence at Whitechapel Gallery. Born in Mauritius, his work focuses on Indian Ocean and European historical legacies that have shaped the region. Uh, the, artist the artist's practice explores the social, political, and historic conditions integral to Mauritian uh, cultural identity and the wider Indian Ocean region. So, Shiraz, thank you so much for joining uh, the group and take it away. Thank you so much. The Indian Ocean region, home to the multiple crossovers of Africa and Asia. Just check. Are you seeing that presentation on the right screen? Oh, we see this map, yes. Thank you. Home to the multiple crossovers of Africa and Asia would eventually shape European ambitions of empire. The boundaries of the eastern trade routes, redrawn from the movement of spice and silks to include the burgeoning demand for flesh and labor through colonization, this would sway the balance of power in Europe and beyond. Such was the prize to control these routes, that the plantation and the means of spice and sugar production would emerge early on from the late 16th century. The presence of Portuguese and then Dutch navigators would leave their mark on the region's islands and atolls, and it is from here the strategic importance of the Mascarene Islands would become apparent. It is important to note that whilst these islands appeared on early Arabian maps, they presented little importance to the complex mercantile networks operating between Madagascar, the Somali coast, and northward to the Arabian Gulf, and the Malabar coast. The presence of enslaved people on the island of Mauritius can be dated back to the Dutch settlements of 1598. The Dutch introduced sugarcane to the settlement but struggled to maintain a permanent base, with slaves often escaping into the island's forest interior. Through a poor understanding of tropical ecologies, the settlement relied on constant outside supplies. Cyclones, pest infestations and illnesses slowed its development for another century. The Mascarines saw their most defining period through the French EIC. Under the directorate of the French crown, a policy to settle the islands and introduce a patriarchal societal structure began with land concessions granted to retiring soldiers and early arrivals from Brittany. In 1715, the French renamed Mauritius, renamed Mauritius Ile de France and with the governor Mahi de la Bourdonnais saw the large scale development of the island. During this period, it served as a successful shipbuilding base and a strategic site for raids against British ships. Through this relative commercial success, and as the island's colony established itself, Mauritius's plantations began to expand, and with this, the large scales trafficking of, of enslaved people from East Africa and Madagascar. The rapid clearing of the island's forests made way for more sugar planting and to reduce the now growing maroon communities. By 1784, the French Crown's Code Noir policy had developed the island and neighboring Rodrigue and Ile Bourbon as a plantocracy. With this came the normalization of slavery and theological entanglement with French Catholicism. With maroon hunts and a brutal regime for the enforcement of the Code Noir, the colonial project defines itself as a system underpinned by absolute violence. Such was the power amassed by the newly forming sugar barons of Ile de France that by 1802, they had formed a significant part of the planters petitioning Napoleon and to reintroduce slavery. In, so, in 1810, the island would transfer to the British crown, who continued to allow the dominance of the planter class on the island's societal and economic affairs. The healthy flow of taxation allowed the French planters to continue with little interference. By 1833, the abolition of slavery would see the British seeking to quell the fears of a mass exit of labor from its plantations. This brought into play the much debated slave-free labor of the East Indies. The great experiment brought laborers from the now increasingly impoverished Indian states, formerly under English EIC rule. 
The success of this in Mauritius led to the mass movement of Indians under the indentured labor system to almost every sugar producing British colony. And by the early 20th century, over half a million Indians had arrived in Mauritius and with it again, the island's racialized system was shifted. The demise of the French patriarchal familial system gives way to the Victorian project and the engineering and civilizing of empire commences. <clears throat> The social and political dynamics of Mauritius, today, of Mauritius today are split along ethnic and religious lines. The majority Hindu population holds power over the judiciary and parliament. The Creole, Muslim and Chinese communities form the second half of the population with a small collection of Franco-Mauritian families who still own the majority of the sugar plantations. With a small collection, the, the Mauritius Commercial Bank was created with the investment from the two million pounds estimated to have been paid in compensation to the planter families for the loss of their slaves. The landscape of Mauritius today is still one dominated by sugar plantations. The island with no indigenous population becomes a prism of the colonial project. Every community on the island has been brought to converge on the plantation. Through the mechanism of empire, Mauritius reflects the deep traumas of separation and erasure. The plantation becomes both a site of displacement and extraction. In Megan Vaughan's book, Creating the Creole Island, she estimates over 80,000 enslaved people arrived on the island between 1769 and 1793. It is likely Mauritius served as a major port for East African slave traders into the Americas and the Caribbean. These early series of works sought out the symbols and spaces that shaped the post-independent state. How so much of the region's romanticism held dualities at its core that continually allude to the violence of, of, it, of their inception. The Indian Ocean miniatures paintings reference classical French framings with hand-drawn naval maps suggestive of an Orientalist exotifying of a region redrawn through an outside gaze, where wealth creation sits at the heart of all affairs. This work comes together in the Ile de France film, work presented at the Dakar Biennial, as part of Zoe Butt's Journey Beyond the Arrow for the 14th Sharjah Biennial in 2019. This work presents the landscape of the early colony and identify, and I, through, this work presents the landscape of the early colony and further opens the question of duality and violence that's, that exists through the fractured identities of slave and indentured communities, and ultimately that of European settler families. I'm just gonna turn this up now and just show you a few moments of this video. The 18th century French Enlightenist Bernardin de Saint-Pierre visited Mauritius and based his novel Paul and Virginie there. The colony is presented at odds with the corruption of the French upper classes in the metropole, where in the book the colonists live at one with their slaves in the balance of nature. 
Megan Vaughan highlights Bernadette's diary, which describes the proximity in which slave owners live with their slaves, the sexual violence and the maroon hunt, where he declares the beautiful scenery vanished and I was faced with a land of abomination. Maroon hunting parties were common and became so lucrative that some colonists abandoned ag agricultural pursuits in favor of this. Through the course of my own research, I spent time in Lamorne village, a community that formed from Maroons and the free black community that congregate around the base of the Lamorne mountain after abolition. Lamorne became the last stronghold for Maroon communities as the island's forests were cut down. The mountain has sheer cliffs and a large V-shaped crevasse that makes for a difficult ascent. The final story of Le Mans reads that after, the ab after abolition, a troop of soldiers were sent to the mountain to inform the Maroons that they were now free. Seeing the soldiers ascending the cliff face, the Maroons decided death was better than capture and the community threw themselves from the cliff tops. The origins of this story remain contested. However, members of the community today describe finding skeletons draped in the trees around the base of the mountain up until the 1950s. Others explain that such was the short lifespan of slaves on Ile de France and the terrifying reality that there was no escape from the island. Le Morne, a peninsula that juts out in the direction of the, lane of the mainland, became a site of ritual suicide as Maroons threw themselves symbolically back to Africa. Today, this community is highly politicized, like the rest of Mauritius, as it fights for land rights and compensation for their forced removal from the mountain in the post-abolition period. Origin and the need to homogenize to a larger base continue to endure across all communities. Rosabel Boswell in La Malaise Creole describes authenticity as a key factor in the fracturing and limiting of a national sense of identity. She associated, shame associated with emancipated communities continues to haunt the psychological space where whiteness and racial hierarchy prevail. Homogenization allows for perceived alliances with a larger, stronger base. In 1901, Mahatma Gandhi visited Mauritius to visit, to observe the conditions of the indentured labor system. He gave a speech to a small crowd of Indians in which he expressed the need for them to self-educate and become politically active. A century later, the Hindu communities of Mauritius dominate the political landscape with Hindu nationalism at its heart. The Aprovasi Ghat, the site of disembarkation for thousands of indentured laborers, has become a major cultural and patrimonial site along with Le Mans. The significant caste perceptions between Indians and Creoles render these historical sites competing for the national narrative. And I'm just gonna play you another section from the Ile de France film. I regard myself as a soldier, so a soldier of peace. Moi, je me considère comme un soldat, quand même, un soldat de la paix. I know the value of discipline and truth. Je sais très bien la valeur de la discipline et de la vérité. I must ask you to believe me when I say that I have never made a statement of this description that the masses of India, if it became necessary, would resort to violence. En attendant, laissez-moi vous dire que je n'ai jamais dit que les masses de l'Inde, si c'était nécessaire, recourraient à la violence. I regard myself as incapable in my lucid moment. The Creole term has become specifically related to Afro Creoles and continues to be used as a derogative term. Many communities deny any connection with Creole heritage, despite that in the late 19th and early 20th century, Mauritians intermarried, changed face and names in order to change their social status. My own family reflects this Afro-Indo hybridity of Mauritius today. The Creole language and the island Sega music, the most significant traits of national identity and exclusively attributed to Afro-Creoles remains disconnected from associations of, black, of blackness. Boswell examples this through the Sega dance performed for tourists in hotels. Sega music is the traditional island sound that was formed in the slave camps. It was a form of dance and oral storytelling that related black back to Africa and Madagascar. During the 1950s and 60s, it became popularized around the villages of Le Mans Mountain 
and transformed into the national music of Mauritius, much like reggae and calypso has in Caribbean. And I'm just going to play you a little clip of this Chifreya video from, I believe, the 1960s. <laughs> Boswell argues that tourism plays out the same economics as the plantation house through visibility and race. White colonists became fixated on the highly sexualized performances, which was ordered to be performed for visiting guests. Today, only the young women who fit the prescribed notions of beauty and proximity to whiteness work the front of house and perform Sega dances. Young Afro-Creole men considered to be easygoing and absent of responsibility remain in emasculated positions. Afro-Creole women find themselves economically better off than the men. The tourism industry offers wider employment for women, from waitressing and housekeeping to evening performances of Sega routines to hotel guests. Young Creole men with limited economic opportunities within mainstream society who seek to, who seek to hold on to their core identities have begun to convert to Rastafarianism, seeking to homogenize with a larger international community, allowing them a political voice. Rastafarianism becomes an empowered identity that being Creole alone does not afford. Today, Sega music has continued to evolve along with the political consciousness of Mauritian youth. As with Creole political links to Rastafarianism, Sega music has also hybridized to meet reggae in the form of Segai. This has followed a long road to see the Creole language formally written in school. The legacies of marine communities through language and music combine into a new political conscious where communities begin to speak of blackness as symbols of survival, resistance, rejecting homogenization as a means of erasure. And I'm just going to play you a short clip of a Segai artist. In the 2019 Art Night London Commission and presented for the Dakar Art Summit in 2020, Prends Courage or Take Courage in Creole draws upon this reflection. The work which explores notions of trauma, both in embedded and generational, draws upon the story of the Maroon in which escape becomes an empowered move where none is possible. The film's narrative uses several Creole words and phrases attributed to slavery. Here, language alludes to a state of resistance, no matter how deeply buried. Creole linguistics offers a window into the potential psychological space of the slave period. Where few written accounts of the lives and experiences of slaves exists, colloquial phrases in the, mo in the almost unchanged Mauritian Creole present an insight into the extreme psychological pressure of slave lives. Almost exclusively European males author most literature and writing from the period. African and Malagasy slave lives are only mentioned after escape and as the maroon. The colonists of Ile de France became obsessed with the fear of their slaves turning on their master. The image of the maroon becomes one of a hyper real black masculinity and the only moment it is not emasculated. Prends Courage presents the possibility of an alternative state where entrenched trauma, emaciated and rooted, takes the form of flight. We're facing complicity in victimhood and to the horrors of subjugation that a new pathway begins to take form. 
The work reflects upon the Creolite writing of Martinetian writers such as Patrick Chamoiseau, where the land holds memory and the traumas can only be released with the acknowledgement of what has passed. Here, shame no longer lingers with erasure. And I'm going to play you out with the last few minutes of this video work. Last one, no longer pressure. Mass exhaled. We are not unattended. And thank you so much for listening. Oh, thank you so much, Russ, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Such a rich array of audio and visual materials demonstrating the connections, uh, you know, the adoption of, that brings together multiple historical dimensions and identities. And uh, it, it just uh, will leave us with uh, many very poignant uh, moments in your presentation really emphasize those connections. So thank you so much for that. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Zoe Butt is a curator and writer who lives in Vietnam. Her practice centers on building critically thinking and historically conscious artistic communities, fostering dialogue among cultures of the globalizing South. Currently artistic director of the Factory Contemporary Arts Center in Ho Chi Minh City, Zoe is a member of the Asian Art Council for the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York, and in 2015 was named the Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum. Zoe, you're on. Thank you. Thank you to the Smithsonian and to everyone joining. Greetings from Saigon. Before we dive into historical fact and artistic revelations surrounding two significant art projects that unravel shared histories between Southeast Asia and West Africa, a personal transgression as initial anchor point. Ooh. It was in 2013 that I traveled by coach through too many airport terminals, more than 40 hours from Saigon to Dakar. A bottomless shell of a taxi collected me, creaking its way around Dakar's magnificent jagged coastline, which conveniently collapsed with engine failure beneath the mammoth African Renaissance monument. At 52 meters high, it is the tallest sculpture in Africa. Built by the Monsunde studio in Pyongyang, this controversial yet mighty declaration of African solidarity had me reeling all the more. For that evening, I dined with a French Senegalese soldier whose guard of a French medical unit had been posted to Vietnam and then Cambodia in the 1970s. 
He had personally witnessed the fall of Saigon in 1975 and Pol Pot's ordering of the bloody exodus of Phnom Penh later that same year. Two momentous moments of little historical recall in the region of Southeast Asia that I now call home. I was then made known of a Vietnamese Senegalese community in Dakar. The telling of such history from Senegal continues to provoke me. Can our colonial experiences be understood in solidarity? Cycle forward to 2015, and I'm in Accra in Ghana for the Asia Africa Conference of the International Institute of Asian Studies. Gut wrenched from my visit to the Elmina Fort, built by the Portuguese, taken over by the Dutch to become known as the site that processed the highest number of slaves across the Atlantic between the 16th to the 19th centuries. I found my need to pay respect to this history completed by a tiny little nondescript house at the other end of this small fishing town called the Java Museum with its Wayang puppetry and batik dedicated to the memories of the Bilanda Hitam, the Black Dutchman, the Ashanti and Akan soldiers recruited for the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army, many of whom were posted to present day Indonesia. I was again compelled by how far I had traveled to learn of a history little discussed in my region. Each time I returned home knowing which artists would be keen to hear more of what I had seen. These two particular artists have since mined the memories of two colonial contexts, researched and visualized from 21st century perspective, who each reveal little discussed histories of relation between Indonesia and Ghana, between Vietnam and Senegal. Of particularity to both is the validity of historical colonial intangibility as memory, as language, as sight but most of all, as the experiences of people, the ancestor of mixed blood, of how their presence has contributed to the cultures and communities of newly formed independent societies across the formerly Dutch and French empires. The first project by Jogjakarta artist, Jomput Kuzudandanto, recalls the Dutch East Indies, beginning with the late 1800s, present day Indonesia where a particular social club in Bandung plays music introduced by freed Portuguese slaves to a highly segregated audience of native Indo-African and Dutch elite. The second by Saigon artist, Tuan Andrew Wen, recalls a French Indochina, present day Vietnam, where Tiradier Senegalese, French colonial forces, faced the odious dilemmas of uprooting their Vietnamese families in the face of French defeat in 1954. In both of these ensuing sculptural video installations, the power of recollection is evident in these artists having spent time with such colonial soldiers and their descendants, where dilemmas of race, class, and political ideology continue to hover. On both counts, the power of narrative as song, as script, emotionally evokes loss, longing, and regret. Both of these major installations were artistic commissions for my co-creation of the Sharjah Biennial 14 in 2019. So let's turn to the commission of John Pet Kuzunandanto and its context. An Indonesian artist long intrigued by empire and its ensuing colonial impact on his people and their culture and society. It is arguably the Portuguese transatlantic slave trade from Africa, begun in the 1440s, through which African peoples came to be first known in Southeast Asia. In Indonesia specifically, this slave trade also with peoples from India and the Malay world. With several of its ports negotiated as trading centers for the Portuguese in the late 1400s, these ports were to become key to the Dutch East India Company in the early 1600s and eventually nationalized in 1800, henceforth the colonial era 
of the Netherlands East Indies began. It was one of the most prized colonies in the Dutch Empire. Its spice and cash crop trade of global dominance, which saw a vast military amassed to guard its material assets. It was during this time that the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army was formed, abbreviated to KNIL. Between 1831 and 1872, over 3,000 Africans were recruited from the Dutch Gold Coast for service as colonial troops in the Dust Dutch East Indies. The Ashanti King, present-day Elmina in Ghana, offered slaves and prisoners of war from the surrounding regions for Dutch colonial service. They were shipped with a Dutch name. Their descendants remain in Indonesia, though sadly today, largely forgotten. Here is an installation view of John Pitt's work. It's called Karen Chonkon Gordia, as I mentioned, commissioned for the Shaja Biennial 14. I would like to play you a brief soundtrack from this installation. just heard is called Kerenchong. Today it is considered Indonesian folk music, eventually lauded by the Dutch as their key contribution to Indonesian culture. But its style is rooted in Portuguese fado, a musical genre rumored to originate with ancient Moors and African seafarers full of melancholy. Its lyrics are often concerning poverty and life on the sea. It arrived in Indonesian ports in the 16th century sung by freed Portuguese slaves of India, Malay, and African origin. Kerenchong grew in popularity at a particular social club called Societe Concordia in Bandung. It was established by the Dutch elite in 1895. The artist John Pitt shares, permission to enter particular areas of Societe Concordia was restricted according to race and class, dividing Dutch, Indo-Dutch, Indo-African, and Chinese descendants, native Indonesians, and other mixed blood community. Ironically, it is to these discriminated peoples that Karen Chong owes its legacy. It is revealing to note that this very building would eventually host in 1955, the Bandung Conference, the first Afro-Asian conference opposing colonialism promoting economic and cultural cooperation. It was the first important step towards the creation of the Non-Aligned Movement, an international organization formalized in 1961 
to aid the national independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and security of countries not wanting allegiance or instruction from any major power bloc. In Jompan's installation, the diverse cultures oppressed and traded by empire are celebrated with their own concordia, their own discordant harmony. In the wake of empire, Karen Chong survives, its thrum persisting in this darkened room. Its multi-ethnic singers pulsing in song as their light continues to ebb from the glass fragments of empire. A bird-like chandelier still tethered to the ceiling, although its head lies in fragments in the floor. On the walls behind this monumental glass bird are two video projections. On one, we see the descendants of these freed slaves singing with their own Kerenchong band, interspersed with figurines from the diorama of the Benteng Vreberg Military Museum in Yogyakarta, an official depiction of Indonesia's fight for freedom. On another channel, we see rice paddies become a haunting set of empty halls as the voice of Dan Cordes, an Indonesian war veteran, shares his memories as a KNIL soldier in the 1930s and 40s, beginning with his childhood in Pohuero, southern central Java, where this pictured Dutch military camp was also based, where African Ashanti and Akan KNIL soldiers were also once housed. This camp would go on to become a military training base for Indonesian forces trained or perhaps more correctly detained by Japanese occupied forces in the 1940s. During this time, in what is now known as Southeast Asia, the French Empire was also facing their own set of challenges in their Indochina. Covering what is present day Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos, French Indochina was established in 1887 its tea, rice, coffee, pepper, coal, zinc, tin, and more sought as profitable asset. By the mid 1940s, rebellion was rife, spurred by the success of the Japanese occupation between 1940 and 1945, who revealed the weakness of the French forces. Thus, Ho Chi Minh and his Viet Minh army gained strength in their call for independence, eventuating in the First Indochina War between 46 and 54. This was to be the first large scale anti-colonial war in which African soldiers took part. Sub-Saharan Africa was the French army's human reserve as had been done since 1914. Whereas the colonial soldiers within the Indonesian KNIL were largely conscripted, within the French colonial ranks, many were career soldiers, particularly those sought to fight in Indochina. Many joined as an economic means of survival were illiterate and had no experience with guerrilla or psychological warfare, elements to which the Viet Minh army excelled. Similarly experienced across the Dutch empire, African soldiers fighting for the French experienced racist attitudes and cultural discrimination from both French soldiers and locals alike. With locals in Indochina referring to these soldiers as Thai Den or black Westerners a derogatory term insinuating a mercenary. Despite this, however, many African soldiers created intimate relations with local women, some returning to West Africa with them after the war. In Twan Andrewan's four channel video installation titled Spectres of Ancestors Becoming, we are given particular insight into the memories of these tireleurs Senegalese who had fallen in love with Vietnamese women interviewing their offspring in Dakar, some of whom grew up not informed of their origins or continue to suffer social discrimination. I would like to share with you one story of this installation here, an imagined conversation narrated by Anne-Marie Niani, a woman whose parents carry this history. This excerpt will run for five minutes and for the purpose of this online presentation, the screen is divided into four for best viewing purposes. Intérieur, appartement, Saigon, nuit. L'âne, femme vietnamienne, approchant la trentaine, lave la vaisselle dans un évier. 
un homme grand et noir, Wally, entre. On vient de m'informer, on est sur le prochain bateau. Le pasteur part dans trois jours. Il faut vraiment qu'on prévoie des manteaux pour les enfants. Ils n'ont pas besoin de manteaux. Marseille est froide à cette époque de l'année. On pourrait y être pour un moment avant qu'ils nous transfèrent chez nous. Ils vont geler sans manteau. Les enfants ne gèleront pas à Saigon, c'est ici, chez nous. On ne va pas recommencer, il n'y a plus de temps pour ça. Quand on s'est marié, tu ne m'avais pas dit qu'on aurait à partir d'ici. Quand on s'est marié, on était en pleine guerre. Maintenant, il n'y a plus de guerre. Ce n'est pas moi qui décide de partir ou non. Je suis soumis au cours de l'histoire. Nous avons perdu. Nous Tu sais ce que je veux dire. Si on reste, je peux tout aussi bien me suicider. Cinq de nos soldats ont déjà été tués. Je ne peux pas sortir dans la rue sans entendre un haut-parleur ou voir des banderoles pour me rappeler que je ne suis pas le bienvenu ici. Et j'ai des ordres. Rester ici fera de moi un traître. Alors c'est moi que tu préfères trahir. Toi et moi appartenant au même camp, l'âne, celui des assujettis. Et nous ne contrôlons rien de ce qui nous arrive. Mais nous pouvons faire le choix d'être ensemble et tu dois me suivre. Même si la guerre est finie, le français maintient son emprise sur la vietnamienne sans défense. Le français ne me fais pas rire. Je ne suis français que quand ils ont besoin de corps pour arrêter les balles. Et noir le reste du temps. Ne m'appelle plus Taïden, s'il te plaît. Taïden, c'est juste un occidental à la peau noire. Je ne suis pas un occidental. Ce n'est pas un terme péjoratif. Pour moi, si. Pas comme les mots que vous utilisez, vous, et les Français blancs, pour parler des filles ici. C'est toi qui veux aller à Marseille. C'est pas l'Occident, ça, peut-être. Notre destination finale, c'est Dakar. Ma famille est là-bas. Ils nous aideront en attendant que je sois affectée. Et moi, quelle sera ma place au Sénégal Tu seras ma femme. Tu es ma femme ou bien une de tes femmes. Qu'est-ce que tu essayes de dire exactement Ma religion m'autorise plusieurs mariages. Elle n'en fait pas une obligation. Ce n'était pas non plus une obligation pour ces soldats qui sont retournés et ont épousé d'autres femmes. Qu'est-ce que je deviendrai dans ce cas-là Je ne sais pas quoi te dire. Tu dois me faire un peu plus confiance après six ans de mariage et trois enfants. Tu crois que c'était facile pour moi d'élever ces enfants seuls Tu étais constamment parti dans tes missions. J'imagine ce que ça peut donner dans un endroit complètement inconnu. Et ta famille, elle, accueillerait à bras ouverts cette femme vietnamienne, ramener des aventures d'un soldat et ses enfants métisses Durant tes absences, je n'aurai personne vers qui me tourner. On s'adapte. Ils s'adapteront. Tout le monde doit s'adapter à un moment ou à un autre. So you have just watched one of four stories with inspectors of ancestors becoming. Through this imagined exchange, we hear contempt in Wally's voice. I'm French only when they need bodies to take bullets. I'm black at all other times. We hear fear and doubt in Lan as she recounts the hardship of motherhood without support, concerned his Dakar family will not accept his Vietnamese wife and their Matisse children. And then comes the near derision for his culture's polygamy. 
and her feelings of betrayal as he makes evident that France may no longer control her country, but they can still control her destiny. He tries to placate. We are on the same side. As the subjugated, we are subjected to the course of history. In another story in this installation, a Senegalese man reads a letter by his Vietnamese relative, her broken French reminding her Senegalese love of the child she believes he will forget, but she forgives him. In another, we hear Atelier Senegalese sing the Vietnamese national anthem in Vietnamese with pride. In another, we hear from a Vietnamese Senegalese descendant of how his origins had been concealed from him, discovering his biological mother was Vietnamese and wanting to have his own daughter to have her name, Nguyen Thi, a name his father considers brutally culturally beneath him. The son's consternation and disgust with his father's attitude and beliefs is made plain. Interspersed between these narratives is archival photographs of this war-torn era amongst cherished family portraits. We also see the practice of Vervinam in the suburban landscape of Dakar, a Vietnamese martial arts that remains practiced there to this day. Claiming the memories of our descendants is critical to the process of decolonizing our minds, our language, our habits, and our physical landscapes today. Donna Haraway writes, it matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters what knowledges know knowledges. It matters what relations relate relations. It matters what worlds world worlds. It matters what stories tell stories. Histories that are overlooked are of central concern to many contemporary artists across my region today. This often deliberate blind eye, a consequence of multiple political and social factors from strategies of ideological or authoritarian regime residual colonial relations of capital that encourage cultural projects from south to north, as opposed to across a lateral south to south, and also cultural stigma concerning issues of race and tradition, all just to name but a few. I believe it important that all practitioners in the business of culture today need to understand their own agency in supporting the stories of those like I have shared with you today. Our cultural institutions cannot be relied upon to give space and argument to the journeys and the impact of humanity. It is up to all of us as researchers, curators, writers, artists, teachers, activists, musicians, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. And this list is endless. It is up to all of us to recognize our own part to play in ensuring that we ask questions of what we accept and assume. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Zoe, for a great presentation, you know, and for sharing with us the ways that artworks and aesthetic expression can really help us understand or experience something of the complicated, painful, and entangled histories, including enslavement, associated with these connections that are forged over time between Africa, Asia, and of course, the wider uh, world. And so, uh, we now move uh, to eight minutes of presentation by our discussant uh, for today, Ka Dr. Kathleen Bickford Burzak. Uh, Kathleen is Associate Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Block Museum, Northwestern University, where she provides artistic leadership uh, of the exhibition, publication, and collections program in support of the museum's cross cultural and interdisciplinary mission. Kathleen is curator of Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, Art, Culture, and Exchange Across Medieval Saharan Africa, a terrific exhibition that opens finally at the National Museum of African Art in mid-October. Uh, so please check out our website. Kathleen, thanks so much and take it away. Uh, thanks, Chris. It's so great to be here. Hello, um, everybody out there. I want to, um, of course, begin by thanking uh, the organizers of this program who've provided an opportunity for us to come together over the next several days to focus on the diverse exchanges between Africa and Asia from past to present. I also want to thank the four speakers 
that we've just listened to um, who provided such rich food for thought and reflection. We've really um, gone on quite a journey today. I'm gonna to devote my comments in this brief response to several interlaced concepts and methodologies that are essential to the types of inquiry and research that often carry the prefix inter. Interdisciplinary, interregional, intersectional, interstitial, and so on. These are frames that are occupied by symposia like this one, Africa Asia, overlooked histories of exchange. My own experience with this type of work is focused on the Sahara as a site, um, as Chris just mentioned. Um, so the Sahara as a site and a conduit for far reaching networks of exchange between the eighth and the 16th centuries before the advent of global navigation. Within today's dominant global knowledge system, which is built on the legacies of Western imperialism, we've been taught to think about the world in particular compartmentalized ways. Africa is a court category, Asia is a category, and each of these are subdivided. There's East Asia and Central Asia, there's North Africa, which is um, separated from Sub-Saharan Africa, Information must be organized, but organizational systems are not objective. They carry the weight of power and bias. And decisions made in the past become the preconceptions of the present. As Elizabeth Lamborn succinctly demonstrates in her presentation, there's a Eurocentric bias in written records of the 18th and 19th century, which have been used to recite a history of exchange that overlooks, to use the term invoked by the symposium's organizers, a great deal. Lamborn also asks us to think about the challenge of writing connected history from heterogeneous sources. Indeed, the bias towards the written record is one that's challenged by interdisciplinary and interregional studies, which often require the wielding of diverse sources. An example from the Sahara includes these tiny fr uh, fragments excavated at a site called Asuk Tadmeka in Mali. Um, at center is a piece of Qingbei porcelain to the top, no bigger than the nail on my index finger. And below is a piece of woven silk about three centimeters long. These were excavated from a 10th to 12th century context at the site but they originated in China. Their presence cannot be explained by the sparse written documents of the period. It must instead be extrapolated by bringing together material analysis, comparison with surviving comparative objects, such as the one you see on the left and the right, and other sources. The papers we've just heard illustrate what is revealed when we shift our attention to alternative perspectives and data. In doing so, they embody a kind of globalism that prioritizes multiple points of view, grounding a global approach with specificity that is applied through time and space. The multifaceted installation by artists Jompet Kuswidananto and Tuan Andrew Nguyen, which were so movingly contextualized by Zoe Butt, explore history through discrete and personalized lenses. Their works reveal ties that join Indonesia with Asia and Indochina with Senegal. And they make visible how individual experiences of empire and colonialism have woven people, cultural practices, social norms and art forms together from the 15th century to the present. In his work, artist Shiraz Baiju shares a complex view of Mauritius, which he describes as, quote, an island with no indigenous population that becomes a prism of the colonial project. He portrays the growth of its population over five centuries, with each individual, whether French planters and merchants, enslaved Africans, or later indentured Indian laborers, deeply embedded in the global sugar, sugar plantation system. Beiju's paintings, photographs, and videos 
also explore contemporary struggles with identity on the island, contemplating the erasure of individuality that results from nationalization, genocide, or political exclusion, as well as the competing rejection and embrace of a blended Creole identity. These projects, each of which derives from research across diverse sources, offers an answer to another of Lamborn's questions. What role can art play in connecting historical narratives? The creation of new methodologies that help us to interpret and connect disparate evidence from the past in an effort to make visible overlooked histories has also been taken up by a number of scholars since the 1980s. Archaeologists Jennifer Wallace and Michael Shanks have each used the term the archaeological imagination to describe how this is manifested in their field. While the literary scholar and cultural historian Sadia Hartman uses a process she calls critical fabulation in her work to rescue the sparsely documented lives of the enslaved from oblivion. I see the presentations of today as working through this same cluster of challenges. These methodologies recognize that history is not fixed or objective. It's open to the relentless decay of the material world, the biases of, recorded, of record keeping, the politics of interpretation, and the subjectivity of memory and perspective. In his paper, Pedro Pombo likewise draws our attention to instability with his focus on the fluid state of borders and boundaries between water and land. He draws on the cycles of ocean currents and monsoons to provide a method for conceptualizing cultural change and exchange. He then uses this as a metaphor for the murkiness of archives, reminding us to, quote, search for muddy documents, to pay attention to the tidal aspects of historic events and to the silting of statistics or political intentions over time. Pombo's reflections move across scales from large to small, coast, island, house, and out again. On the grandest scale, he posits sensory qualities that amount to shared experiences across space, which he calls wider cartographies of Asian, of Afri Afro-Asian worlds. As I wrap up, I want to return to Elizabeth Lamborn's overview, which moves us through time and across space providing a wider view in which to understand the case studies provided by Zoe, Shiraz, and Pedro. Importantly, she concludes by fixing our sights on our current moment. A great deal is changing locally and globally in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and the accelerating global decolonization and racial justice movements. Not surprisingly, or yeah, not surprisingly, Africa, Asia is a locus for these events which many believe will be not just impactful, but paradigm altering. This is as significant a moment as any I can imagine for asking what we can learn by looking intently at the connected past, present, and future of Africa and Asia. So thank you so much for listening to all of us. And I'm going to turn things over to Chris to moderate questions from the audience in the minute or two that we have left. Well, uh, thank you so much, Kathleen, and I think all of our presenters could turn on their cameras uh, because, um, you know, we, we do, we will likely go over a few minutes and apologies, uh, understand if you all can't stay. A couple of reminders, we have two more days to go, uh, uh, tomorrow and the next day, same time, same channels, and so do join us for two more great uh, sessions coming up. Uh, these will all, we're tape recording and they will be up on YouTube uh, in about a week or two. So you'll be able to sort of revisit and share. Um, and so before we turn to the Q&A from our, our audience, um, I do think that uh, it would be helpful if our panelists, uh, we're very grateful for their presentation, have anything that they'd like to say, you know, Kathleen, about your comments or some other sort of question that was raised in someone else's presentation this morning. And then we'll turn to a few uh, questions from the public. Um, uh, no pressure here. 
uh, if, the, if you don't have any particular uh, points to raise uh, with Kathleen's uh, comments, which were very helpful in tying together the many presentations then, let me just sort of uh, lob uh, one question out there for uh, some of you to comment on that came from uh, some of our listeners. And that is, uh, how much are local communities cognizant of these shared connections across time and space? You know, it sort of touches Pedro on what you said, Shiraz, Zoe, in a certain degree, uh, you know, with the, the kinds of artworks that you've shown. And so I'm wondering if uh, any of you can speak to that. Um, I, I can start uh, briefly. I, I, uh, I mean, in, in this study the, or with, the, with, the, with my interviews and the research that I've been doing, all these communities that have been for generations living in different places are very aware of um, where they are and how they, how they are spread across many parts of the world. What I think it, for me it's increasingly interesting is that at the same time that we see what we can call a cosmopolitan societies, because there are many different languages, religions, contexts, there are, especially when it comes to the place of a house, which is becoming for me a more interesting uh, place to research, is always uh, uh, the maintenance of um, cultural belonging and identity that makes simultaneously part of the place they are, but simultaneously very aware of where their ancestors came from. And there's this, always this dialogue which is systematically performed. And for example, in the case with the African independences in the 60s and then 75 Mozambique, which was quite later, these diasporic roots go to other places, but there is even a more complex um, connection across different passports, different languages, different official citizenships, but with a systematic rooting in an ancestral place, or in the case of Goans, an ancestral home. So the home, the house in Goa, it's still a very important, um, or the village the family comes from, even after 100 years, 150 years, it's always a very important marker. So I thought it, there, there is a very strong awareness of um, the past, but also the presence of in the, in the social location. Um, Shiraz, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Uh, no pressure there. Sure. Um, I mean, in, in Mauritius, I mean, when I was growing up as a child there, we used to have the news every hour in a different language. Oh. And I believe we used to have the news in something like nine different languages every day. Um, and yet, at the same time, essentialism still very much prevails amongst, you know, as, as one of the factors in, in the fracturing of communities there today, as I was mentioning before. And this, this need to connect to a larger group, a political base outside of the country is still very much, uh, is still very much persistent in how people sort of still define themselves. And so there are still major issues around around coming together as a national identity. So this idea of, of space and time in the Indian Ocean is very much, you know, is, is very prevalent and very, very much in the minds of, of, of folks and, and origin still being, you know, a, a major factor within that. Um, but what is also very assuring that, that amongst them um, sort of, you know, I, I think in the same way that, that we have the intersection with lots, of other, with lots of other groups and communities globally today, that you know, political movements, you know, coming from grassroots groups and 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 more sort of youth-driven um, parts of of, uh, of the society are starting to try and move past that kind of thinking and that kind of fracturing. Thank you. And Zoe, this is sort of a related question in a way. Um, you know, you showed uh, an artwork, uh, the uh, Tuan Andrew Wenton's uh, film about Vietnamese women in Senegal. And uh, one of our or one of our attendees wanted to know if this work was shown in Vietnam, and how Vietnamese uh, feel about this, these sorts of histories, legacies, the legacy of the Indochina War. You know, knowing how uh, ostracized 
Amerasians were after the American War. So I don't know if there's a way for you to just sort of touch on that in the brief time we have. Yes, thanks to Nora Taylor for chiming in. Um, there are not as yet confirmed plans to show it in Vietnam, although I know that Tuan would very much like to, and as would I. The memories of what I presented in Vietnam and Indonesia are not easy histories to access. Um, they have little monuments to them. There are no history books that touch on them. Their communities are very small and uh, particularly in the context of Vietnam, that piece of history is very charged politically and not easy to present to a public uh, in Vietnam. We suffer quite strict cultural regulations on what can be made public. Um, I think that there's a, a phenomenal amount of work to be done in capturing the memories of these communities. Uh, I know that Jompet in Indonesia struggled to get people to feel open enough to share with him. He met some who recognized their membership in this particular history, but felt still politically unable to comment. So I think that there's still a lot of historical angst and fear on both the Dutch and the French sides that current uh, realities are not addressing. Thank you so much. A specific question possibly for Elizabeth, uh, I'm guessing. Uh, given the expansion of trade beginning in the eighth century with Africa and Asia, was there a role or could you speak to the role that Islam played uh, in this, uh, you know, given the specificity of the time uh, and the spread of Islam, uh, you know, from sort of late, uh, uh, well, sixth century when it was founded, but it's seventh century uh, going. Yes, no, of course. Um, it's a really, really good question. So thank you. Um, I think we have to be wary of attributing um, the rise of Islam as the cause of everything. And so um, it's important to think about the Indian Ocean at this period of having a very strong, vibrant um, Tang Chinese um, polity at one end that is growing economically and that is part of the stimulus. And obviously there you have very little to do with Islam as an agentic cause in this, but certainly looking then at the western ends of the Indian Ocean, um, I think most historians would agree that there's absolutely no doubt that the unification of a, such a large area, so the unification under Islam of the former Sasanian um, lands in Iran and Central Asia, and then Byzantine territories in Mesopotamia across the North Africa. And then also, of course, eventually um, conquests and raids into Northern India create a large economic block, um, eventually quite quickly with a single currency, um, one system of law, even if everybody is not um, converted to Islam for many centuries yet. And so there is a feeling that that um, on economic ground, grounds alone, that kind of greater, um, greater territory, single law, um, single currency is a great impetus to trade, certainly. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And for Pedro and others may have uh, input as well. Um, Pedro, do you have a sense what parts of India were, uh, were most of the sort of Indians who are living or were, were and are living in Zanzibar, where they came from in India, Zanzibar, Mozambique, and Tanzania? Where were the uh, Indian populations living there originally from in India? Do you have a sense of that? Um, yes, generally uh, in the coast of East Africa, the most of the Indian origin would come from Gujarat, several uh, Muslim Hindu Jain communities from different areas of Gujarat who have been settled um, in East Africa for several centuries. That's one of the reasons Portuguese really wanted to conquer Tiu, because the island, because the island of Tiu had and Parsi, and Parsi also had a very, had a very uh, fundamental, fundamental role to unite Western, Western India and the, 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 the Red Sea and the, the, the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula, and with that, all the Swahili coast. So all these trading communities, much earlier than the Portuguese arrived in the Indian Ocean, would be trading um, 
in East Africa and Goans also after the Portuguese. But Goans start to go at the end, second half of the 19th century. And not only for trade, but for business, uh, colonial administration, mostly to British East Africa, which had more economic possibilities than in Mozambique. And also photographers, architects, the history of the cinema in East Africa is deeply connected with Goans. So it's a different, uh, all these uh, communities are quite different from the other Indian origin communities that would, would go as intended labors for Mauritius, for example, or Reunion, or even for Zanzibar, but they were established mostly from Gujarat, Western Great. India. Great, uh, there Great. Were yeah, there were a couple of personal comments that were uh, mentioned. Uh, Pedro, for your presentation, it was beautifully done and it really gave uh, one of our attendees who's an artist sort of uh, inspiration. And so thank you for that. And speaking of artistic inspiration, Shiraz, uh, there was a lovely comment about your acrylic, uh, you know, historic paintings framed in Baroque and Rococo style that they are fabulous. So well done there and uh, looking forward to learning more about your work as time goes on. So thank you uh, for that. And I think uh, then maybe for just a final point and you know, obviously we could discuss this at great length, but I'll just share it in case someone wishes to say something. Um, but uh, someone noted that Shiraz and other presenters have raised the issue uh, of uh, the degree to which intercultural exchanges between Africa and Asia and elsewhere to be sure uh, are so often based on violence, uh, you know, uh, uh, empire building, you know, involuntary, uh, you know, conscription to service. Uh, and to what degree uh, do academics uh, try to recognize that background? I have my own thoughts on that, though I work in a museum, but, but we do, uh, you know, in our exhibitions and our publications, I will say, we try to recognize these complexities of history and to figure out ways through, uh, in the case of museums, through the uh, engagement with objects and the ways that artists and artworks can speak so potently to these uh, longstanding issues and very deep, uh, longstanding his uh, histories and very deep sort of personal connections that people have, that th these are sort of ways, including the classroom can be a way as well, for beginning to get people to understand these histories and to recognize them. I think most, you know, responsible academics, most responsible, you know, museum professionals, most responsible people are really trying to understand and recognize that these histories of oppression of uh, lack of empowerment, of uh, you know, of being disenfranchised, uh, of you know, that there are ways that we can now try as best we can to bring those voices uh, to front and center, allowing people to speak about themselves, represent themselves. And I think in the coming days, you will see uh, you know, a number of uh, ways that this kind of self-representation, this engagement of the entanglements and the very tough aspects of history can be brought creatively to the fore through uh, visual arts, material culture, uh, through the work of very creative artists, some of whom are on our panel today. So I want to thank you all for uh, sticking with us this very first great day, I think. Uh, we're unable to address any more questions, but please join us tomorrow to continue the conversation as we pivot to consider the lives of individuals whose travels between Africa and Asia by chance or by force reveal complex networks of contact and entanglement across time. See you tomorrow and thank you so very much. <laughs>